and welcome to Crying on My Yoga Mat. My name is JD, and this podcast is all about building a community where, alongside amazing guests, we have real conversations about the low lows, celebrate the highs, and everything in between. I know what it's like to go through life feeling stuck and powerless to do anything about it. Here, you'll meet yourself where you are and learn tangible tools to help you become who you want to be while honoring the journey. You've gotten this far, so let's keep going together. Take a deep breath and let's go. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Crying on My Yoga Mat. I recently finished reading the book, Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents, How to Heal from Distant, Rejecting, or Self-Involved Parents by author Lindsay Gibson, which got me thinking more about the general topic of emotional immaturity. So that's what we're going to talk about today. In this episode, we'll have a brief overview of what exactly emotional immaturity is, as well as, wait, am I emotionally immature? how to handle interactions with an emotionally immature person, and how to protect and support yourself. Before I begin, I want to have the disclaimer that most of this knowledge is coming from Lindsay Gibson's book. So definitely give that a read. She's got some follow-up books as well that I'm excited to dive into deeper in the future. Please remember, I am not a healthcare professional. Take everything that is said here today with a grain of salt and measure it against your values and what you feel to be true for yourself. Without me delaying any further, because I will be honest with you, I delayed this episode. It's a really big topic, and I don't want to come off like the expert, so I'm just going to give you some words from other people, my personal experiences, and it's going to be great. The cover art for this episode, as you can see on my Instagram, crying on my yoga mat, or through the Podbean website, you will see a photo of me and my family when I was seven. (laughs) I don't know why we were all so grumpy in that photo. I think it was just because my parents didn't like photos being taken of them. And we're not going to solely focus on parental emotional immaturity in this. So let's get going. JD, you said you tell us what emotional immaturity is. And yes, here it is. So the APA dictionary definition for emotional immaturity is a tendency to express emotions without restraint or disproportionately to the situation. The second definition for it is it's a lay term for maladjustment. And when you look more into emotional immaturity, it really is kind of a maladjustment. These are things that were passed down through generations of emotional immaturity. And before the hairs on your body start standing up and you start going, danger, danger, hold yourself. Just take a deep breath with me right here because I know I need it. So I'm going to take a deep breath. (sighs) We are not here to label anyone. We are here to learn tools in how to best interact with others. And we're here to learn more about ourselves. Which brings us really beautifully into, wait, am I emotionally immature? And I, myself, JD, am. So it's something that I've been working on for a very, very, very long time. And I was really blind to it for even longer Things that came so naturally to me and things that I just saw as ripples of trauma was actually my own emotional immaturity. It was, I mean, you've heard me say this so many times in other episodes and in guest episodes of other podcasts that I've been on. It really took me realizing I need to be accountable for myself and my actions and my words and my emotions and As much as every emotion that I have is valid, the way that I go about showing them sometimes is not appropriate. And as someone who is extremely emotional and feels so strongly that their emotions need to be seen and heard, that's a really difficult thing to hold. Let me give you a few examples directly from the book Adult Children of Emotionally Immature Parents about kind of some of the characteristics or things that 
you can see in emotionally immature people. Now, please note, the language is pretty blunt. Just, again, take it with that grain of salt, take the tools, and hold yourself because you are safe. So emotionally immature people can be self-preoccupied and self-involved. They don't quite experience mixed emotions. There's a lot less gray areas in their thinking, which leads to differences in quality of thought. So an example is that excessive childhood anxiety can lead not only to emotional immaturity, but also to oversimplified thinking that can't really hold opposing ideas in mind which is kind of a factor we're going to come back into later when we're talking about ways to relate to and interact with emotionally immature people. They can have a poor sense of time and seem like they're emotionally manipulative. And sometimes they can also truly be emotionally manipulative. And for me, this book was a really hard read. Not only did I see both of my parents, I also saw so much of not only my past self, but my current self. And it can be difficult to not feel a little bit defeated when you're seeing these really blunt pages speaking about the negatives and how we harm others because we were a lot of the time not purposefully harmed in the past. So that's a little bit about how we can kind of tell if we ourselves are emotionally immature. Now we come into the meat of it. This is the stuff that you really, really want to hear. This is how to interact with and relate to an emotionally immature person. So the book breaks this down into three basic steps. The first is expressing what it is you need to express and then letting go. The second is focusing on the outcome, not the relationship. And the third is managing the experience, not engaging. When it comes to the first section, expressing, then letting go, it's extremely important to engage in a calm, non-judgmental way. Don't try to control the outcome of that interaction. It's so vital And I know, really, really tricky. Release the need for the other person to hear you or for them to change. Yeah, I know. In a different section of the book, Lindsay talked about how when we grow up, we have a healing fantasy as well as a role self And that healing fantasy can be when we're younger and we're longing for a parent figure to scoop us up and love us in the way that we need to be loved. And we end up continuing that healing fantasy into our adulthood. We bring it into many of our relationships. As well as our role self, we see the need or the only space for us in our family unit or whatever we grew up in, and we meet that. And that stays with us until we take a step back and catch it and go, oh, what was I? Who was I? Before I took on this role self. I say that because the healing fantasy that we have, that that loved one or that human being that is emotionally immature is a part of in our minds is still so prevalent. Even if it's at the back of our minds, it's still within us. And that first step of releasing that need for the other person to hear you or change is not an easy one. Additionally, your goal in this interaction is to express your true thoughts and wants in a calm and clear way. So there's no tiptoeing. There's no hoping they'll understand your nuance because if there's been times before you've been disappointed because they have not understood your underlying meaning, then that goes to show that you've got to be expressive in a calm and clear way. Next, for focusing on the outcome, not the relationship. This... (laughs) 
This is big, everyone. What are you trying to get from the other person in this interaction? If it's empathy or a change of heart, come up with a different, specific, and achievable goal. One example that the book shows is a daughter whose father really loves to be the center of attention during family get-togethers. So in one specific family get-together, their goal was to make sure that their father did not have the opportunity to be able to do that. So when they saw the fact that the space was literally setting it up so that he could start going into a diatribe, she adjusted the spacing of the people in the room so that he wasn't able to do so, and they were able to just continue on cohesively as a family unit. So that person had to put aside their thoughts of, ugh, I just wish he wouldn't. Or I just wish this would be easier. And she just did it because that was her goal. If and when you focus on changing the relationship or improving it on an emotional level, an emotionally immature person can regress emotionally and then begin to attempt to control you and the situation. Now, this was one of the things that really cut me super, super deep because I looked back at my adult relationship with my parents and understood that that's kind of what happens sometimes. That's when a lot of the conversations that get more difficult to continue happen. That's when my heart rate starts to go up. That's when I feel even myself regressing back into my emotionally immature ways. And the emotionally immature person in the situation may not be conscious of what they're doing. They may not also be doing it maliciously. It may just be their body and psyche trying to control the situation so that they can stop feeling upset. Because an emotionally immature person isn't necessarily able to handle emotions being brought to them, especially for myself. It's, I feel blamed. I feel as though I am a bad person. And when I'm in that space, it's really hard for me to come out of it and engage in a healthy, meaningful discussion. But if you did listen to our last episode, episode 13, with my husband, Ryan, you'll see that that is something that is being worked on, and it is a heck of a journey, but we're working on it. Focusing on a specific question or outcome is a lot more likely to reach that person's adult side. That's the side that can be analytical, that can stand outside of the emotions that they're already not used to being in. So many people, our parents, our grandparents included, weren't taught or displayed good emotional regulation. And we're just wandering around feeling our feelings, which is amazing, but we can be a wrecking ball. To those around us and then they're not able to experience their feelings in their fullest emotion in their fullest truest form the last of the three is managing not engaging so that looks like instead of emotionally engaging with immature people set a goal of managing the interaction this is really an extension of the other ones we've already been talking about and you know If you've listened to even one episode of this podcast, you know that I am someone who really loves emotional depth. So to read that largely, I'm not able to engage emotionally with my parents to the depth that I would love to is gut-wrenching. But it's also a really good tip. This helps me know that what I was already doing in creating boundaries and space was a step. Thinking of needing to have surface relationships with some of the people in my life is sad. I absolutely grieve the losses that are involved in this. I grieve the fact that My healing fantasy will never come true. I grieve the fact that 
there is a very strong chance that I will never have an emotionally mature relationship with either of my parents. I grieve the people who have cut me out of their lives because of my emotional immaturity. And sometimes grief can be a really good place to begin. So as much as I am sitting here with tears rolling down my face, I want to offer you encouragement. Because so often we can think that we have to completely distance ourselves. And in some circumstances, we may need to. But there is the potential to maintain a relationship with people that show signs of emotional immaturity. It will likely never be what we would love it to be, but we are still able to hold that person with us. And in some cases, there can be growth. I am so deep in the thick of this. I really am still walking a tightrope every day when it comes to my own emotional maturity levels. With that being said, I want to encourage you. There is hope. There are things you can do. One specific crying on my yoga mat Instagram follower wanted to know how to stay calm. For that, I'm going to say you need so, so, so much self support. Know who you are and what you stand for. And when you do interact with those people, if you need to express your wants or feelings and then let go, focus on the outcome, not the relationship and manage rather than engaging. Remember, Emotionally immature people can be sensitive to even limited amounts of perceived criticism. So you've got to have that calm, non-judgmental tone. And I'm going to say this right now. Thank you for being maybe the only one to put this work in. To make the effort. Because you likely won't be met with the same calm, non-judgmental tone if they are activated. Thankfully, you have your own full support. You know what you're about. You are a kind person, full of love. Take lots and lots of deep breaths. And support yourself in the ways that you need to. Create space where there needs to be. Always be in communication with your body. You know what's best for you. Crying on my yoga mat would be nothing without you, the listener, and your support. Every single download means so much to me. And if you were ever looking for further ways to support the podcast, there is different opportunities, such as supporting affiliates that the podcast is involved with. Like right now, we've got an awesome partnership with Workspacery and their Enneagram Planner. Mine is already pre-ordered. You can try your different types and get your undated planner now. At checkout, enter crying on my yoga mat to support the podcast and get yourself a discount. Thanks again for supporting me and crying on my yoga mat. I'll see you next time. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it on social media. You can tag me on Instagram at crying on my yoga mat so I can see what you're learning and loving about the show. Until next time.